Good morning, Four Corners. It's a blessing. It's a blessing to be able to worship with you, and um, I'm just very grateful. I'm very grateful to be a member of this church. Yesterday, um, yeah, periodically we get to do uh, new members classes, and uh, we got to do one of those yesterday, and I always love uh, sitting through those, and usually my favorite, my favorite part of that is hearing Doug do the history of Four Corners from uh, the pre-Alamo phase to the bar phase to Savannah Street to Madras when we were in exile, now to uh, 1608 Highway 29 North um, I, uh, I just, I never, I never, I never tire of hearing how the Lord has not removed his lampstand from this church. I want to invite you to go ahead and turn your Bibles to uh, Amos chapter 8. We only have a few sermons left in our series in Amos. And uh, Josh prayed for the bells, and I believe, Lord willing, uh, they return this week to the States and uh, very well could be worshiping with us next week. So I want to go ahead and again remind you to be preparing yourself in Luke uh, as we start Luke at the beginning of August. Um, We'll have uh, Christmas in August, um, depending on how quickly we get through that, but um, we get the the long birth narrative of Christ there in Luke. So go ahead and be preparing yourselves for Luke over the next few weeks. But as we come to the end of Amos, we have two main visions left. I'll remind you that in this last third of the book, Amos is reporting what he sees from the Lord, these visions. And today's vision is the second half of the second pair of visions. You'll remember last week that visions three and four were interrupted by the showdown in the sanctuary, that the content of the third vision, as, as Amos spoke to what's going to happen to uh, the, the throne of the king, Jeroboam, there in the northern kingdom, uh, enrages the priest, and there's this showdown in the sanctuary where the opposition comes to confront the faithful prophet. It was a, a battle between the seed of the serpent and the seed of the woman. And as, as the priest comes to oppose Amos, he attempts to corrupt the word in twisting Amos' words and also suppress the word in doing what the, doing what the, the, uh, uh, the evil kings do and priests do, which is to silence the prophets. These are satanic schemes Anything that attempts to silence or corrupt the word is a a scheme of Satan, and we don't need to make any bones about that. Amos, however, on the other corner of the ring, responds with faithful obedience. The Lord said, go. He picked me up as as a herdsman and a dresser of sycamore figs, and so I went and now hear the word of the Lord. So he's obedient and he's faithful immediately. Amos is not deterred on his mission, so when we get into chapter 8 today, he just picks right back up where he left off. The end of the third vision got interrupted by the showdown, and then he just picks right back up with the fourth vision, and that's where we begin today. Chapter 8 will begin with the fourth vision in this series, but that only lasts through verses 1, 2, and 3. The rest of chapter 8 is going to sound like familiar territory to us with the evidence of crimes, the sins of Israel presented, and the judgment issued on that basis. Chapter 8 is a challenging chapter. If you've read ahead, maybe you've already, already noticed that, but All of Amos, to some degree, has been challenging and foreign to us, and we worked through that, and I think over the last few months, we've gotten gotten used to the language of of uh, of this prophet. We've gotten used to prophecy as a genre, but here in chapter eight, we come to the end of Israel, and I think chapter eight is particularly sobering. We'll see the same with chapter nine next week, but 
I think, I think for an individual, if an individual who has had a, a steady diet of God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life or, or a steady diet of, 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 a, of a faith that generally just sidesteps God's wrath and his, his holiness breaking out against sin or a diet that, that is generally filled of, as Lonnie likes to call, prac apps for life. Seven steps to a good marriage. Christianity is about, you know, three ways to find joy and dot, dot, dot. If we come to Amos chapter eight with that kind of diet, this is going to be strange and foreign and even offensive. My God wouldn't act like that. Or, or maybe we don't go that far. and say, well, the good news is at least we have Jesus now. We don't have to worry about that phase of God, that, that, that angle, that side of God. We don't have to worry about that anymore now that Jesus has come. Well, we're not helicoptering into this passage. Fortunately, we come in on the heels of almost a dozen messages in Amos that have set the context for us. The holy and perfect God of the universe has created a people for his own possession. He created them out of nothing by his mercy. They had nothing to deserve his goodness and yet he lavished it on them and he, he created this people and instructed them to live in a particular way in order to reflect his glory. He didn't instruct them to, to be weird for weird's sake as if there was some virtue in just being different for its own sake. He instructed them to live in a way that's consistent with his own character so that when Israel does, they reflect his character to the rest of the world. This is a holy God beyond all comparison who has lovingly stepped into the world that he created, down into the dirt, into a world of sinful people to redeem them and give them abundant life. And Israel has said, no. That God has stepped into their situation and Israel, the northern kingdom, has said, no thanks. Well, as we have seen several times, the holy God of the universe cannot just shrug off such rejection and just flick it away as if it's not a problem. It's not, it's not because he, he demands attention because he's some kind of uh, egomaniacal tyrant who wants everybody to be about him. It's actually because of his very essence that he can't just let this go. When God, God attaches himself via a covenant to, to a people on the condition that they reflect his glory and his image. And when they don't, his holiness reacts to that. It's like, it's like a chemical reaction. God's, God's holiness is not a part of his will. It's part of his nature. God does not choose to be holy any more than the sun chooses to be hot. The sun is hot because it's the sun. That's just what it is by nature. God is holy because that's what he is by nature. It's not a matter of his will. Sin is an offense to God's holiness. So when that offense comes against his holiness, it's like a chemical reaction that breaks out in wrath and judgment. To not do so would be to approve of sin, to be okay with sin, to pat sin. And then to approve of sin would deny God's very essence. He's perfect. To approve of sin would be to deny other parts of his own being. God is, God is undivided in his perfections. He cannot deny himself and approve of sin. So you see, therefore, why he cannot simply shrug off Israel's rejection. You see, therefore, why a challenging chapter like Amos 8 is the, the natural response, the deserved response from this, uh, for this sinful people against this holy God. This is the God who speaks these challenging words, the holy one who cannot deny himself. I'll remind you what we said at the very beginning of the series a few months ago. When we come to the genre of biblical prophecy, we, we, we typically want to just go forward. We typically want to just see how the prophets are predicting the future. We should, we should, we should uh, be slow to do that because initially what the prophets are doing is interpreting the present situation in Israel in light of the past covenant 
And then, and only then, to predict what may happen in the future, depending on how they're living in accordance with that covenant. Well, we have seen several times throughout Amos, God's, God's analysis of the present situation, his referring back to the covenant, and what we get in Amos chapter 8 today is primarily his pointing forward to the future, pointing forward to what will happen since they have not lived according to their promises. God will uphold his end of the covenant. So if you would please go ahead and stand and out of reverence for God's word as we did a minute ago, and we will read our text this morning, Amos chapter 8, we'll read the whole chapter, verses 1 through 15. This is the word of the Lord. This is what the Lord God showed me. Behold, a basket of summer fruit. And he said, Amos, what do you see? And I said, A basket of summer fruit. Then the Lord said to me, The end has come upon my people Israel. I will never again pass by them. The songs of the temple shall become wailings in that day, declares the Lord God. So many dead bodies, they are thrown everywhere. Silence. Hear this, you who trample on the needy and bring the poor of the land to an end, saying, When will the new moon be over that we may sell grain and the Sabbath that we may offer wheat for sale? that we may make the ephah small and the shekel great and deal deceitfully with false balances, that we may buy the poor for silver and the needy for a pair of sandals and sell the chaff of the wheat. The Lord has sworn by the pride of Jacob, surely I will never forget any of their deeds. Shall not the land tremble on this account and everyone mourn who dwells in it and all of it rise like the Nile and be tossed about and sink again like the Nile of Egypt? And on that day, declares the Lord God, I will make the sun go down at noon and darken the earth in broad daylight. I will turn your feasts into mourning and all your songs into lamentation. I will bring sackcloth on every waist and baldness on every head. I will make it like the morning for an only sun and the end of it like a bitter day. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will send send a famine on the land, not a famine of bread, nor thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. They shall wander from sea to sea and from north to east, and they shall run to and fro and seek the word of the Lord. But they shall not find it. In that day, the lovely virgins and the young men shall faint for thirst. Those who swear by the guilt of Samaria and say, as your God lives, O Dan, and as the way of Beersheba lives, They shall fall and never rise again. You could be seated. And as we get into Amos chapter 8, let's pray and ask for the Holy Spirit to help us. God, we recognize our smallness in light of the Holy One who cannot deny himself this morning. We pray that by your Holy Spirit, you would help us to understand your word in Amos chapter 8. We know, God, that spiritual things need to be understood spiritually. They need new hearts. God, for those in this room that that are Christ's, that have new hearts, would you, by your Spirit, help us to see your character, your goodness, your holiness, even your mercy here, God, in Amos chapter 8. God, would you, for those this morning that may not know you, might you give eyes to, ear, eyes to see and ears to hear for the first time. God, for our children this morning who are, who are studying Genesis in the back, we pray that you would give them eyes to see and ears to hear your gospel. We want to see your glory this morning, God. Amen. A couple of years ago, my family spent about a year reading through the Chronicles of Narnia series, all seven books, took us about a year. And hands down, our favorite book was The Voyage of the Dawn Treader. Uh, That's the one that begins with the classic line, there was a boy called Eustace Clarence Scrub, and he almost deserved it, which is a, a a great beginning, one of the best lines in the whole series. But it was the ending of that book that sticks with my wife and I the most. 
the ending of that book is, it, it, it hit us unexpectedly. I remember where we were, we were it was wintertime, we were reading by the fire, and it both hit us out of the blue, and we, I, I, I kid you not, wept until the book was wet on my lap. As we began to see what was, what was happening there at the end of that book, when with, with the little mouse threw his sword away because he had no more need of it as he was going into Aslan's country. So anyway, I'll never in the rest of my life forget the first time I read the last few pages of the voyage of the Dawn Treader. The ending of that, I've read it since then too and it didn't quite hit me the same way, but the first time it did, the ending of that book is one that I will remember the rest of my life. Everything ends, life is full of endings, whether it's books, vacations come to an end, our jobs come to an end, the season of sports seasons come to an end. Not every ending, not the ending of everything is as memorable as the ending of that book was for me and my family. Some endings like that one are are beautiful and poetic and they leave us longing for more. Other endings are imperceptible and and nondescript and quiet and go down without even a thought. Well, Amos chapter 8 describes an end that is neither beautiful nor quiet, but horrific. The end of Israel is what is in view in Amos chapter 8. So the title of the sermon this morning is The End of a Season. The End of a Season. Of a season. And and three simple points to help walk us through. These are not very clever points, they just kind of describe the various movements of the passage. The first three verses describe the coming end. Verses four through six give us the old evidence. And the rest of the chapter, verses seven to 14, gives us the repeated judgment. Let's begin there in verse one. As I said, this is the fourth vision, the second half of the second pair of visions begun in chapter seven, then interrupted by the showdown. The point of the fourth vision is that for Israel, the end is near. Remember that the second pair of visions, Amos is not seeing events, but he is seeing realities. The first pair of visions, he saw the event of locusts and the event of fire or drought, and now he's seeing the realities In the third vision, the reality that Israel is crooked when measured against the plumb line of God's perfection. Therefore, the reality of the fourth vision is that the end is near for Israel. This reality is communicated, quite surprisingly for us, with a basket of summer fruit. There's two ways that this summer fruit image communicates the end. And the first way is with a pun or, or a play on words. Your, your, your Bible may have a footnote that says the Hebrew words for end and summer fruit sound alike. This is the difference between kaitz and kates. And I learned this week that at this time in Israel's history, those two probably would have been pronounced identically. In showing, a, in showing Amos a basket of summer fruit, kates, He is showing Amos the end, Kate's, of Israel. But more than just a play on words, this summer fruit would be fruit harvested at the end of the growing season. The season which would have begun begun the previous fall with the annual rains in September, October. Fruit now would have been harvested at the end of that growing season almost a year later in, in July and August. The last of the harvest indicate that the end of the growing season is near. This summer, it's typically been my habit to take a take a break on Friday afternoon or sometimes on Saturday afternoon and go walk through the field, pray over the sermon, pray for you all. And I typically walk through the garden. And now it's the end of the summer. I can you know pick a tomato and and munch on those as I walk. And as I did that yesterday or Friday. I was studying this part of the sermon and realized that's the season we're in right now. I realized that as I saw all the corn stalks piled up against the side that are, that are dried and, and will be, you know, thrown away. And, and um, you know, many of the plants nearing their end, still, still quite leafy and fruitful, but nearing the end of the growing season. We have out here actually on the table 
literal baskets of summer fruit. And I was here Thursday when they harvested. It was overflowing. Uh, Miss Karen said there was an explosion in the garden this week, just between Monday and Thursday, overflowing with summer fruit, reminding us the end of the growing season is near. Well, the reality of the fruit basket vision is this. The season of Israel's existence as a nation is coming to an end. The season of Israel's existence as a nation is coming to an end. We've talked at length already at this point about the dawn of that season. And when I, what I mean in particular is 1 Kings 12, when the kingdom splits in Solomon's two sons, one, one takes the north, one takes the south, civil war ensues. So when we're talking about the end of this season, in particular, we're speaking of the end of this, this geopolitical entity that has sprung up called the northern kingdom of Israel. I'm not talking about the whole corporate people. Remember, there's a, there's a whole other southern kingdom, probably less in number, where Judah is, tribe of Judah, city of Jerusalem, But the fruit basket vision, Amos explains, the end has come upon my people. The end has come upon this entity, Israel. It's comprehensive. Interestingly, in Jeremiah chapter 24, the southern kingdom will get their own fruit basket vision, which Jeremiah will see, but it's a little different. In that fruit basket vision, there's a basket full of figs, good figs and bad figs. And in Jeremiah 24, the point is that the, the bad figs will be cut off. The good figs will be exiled for a time, not cut off entirely, and then replanted in the land. So the image there with the southern kingdom being that a remnant from the fruit basket, so to speak, a remnant from among this rotten fruit will return. And that, that vision anticipates the future return from exile. Well, The northern kingdom's fruit basket vision is not a matter of good fruit and bad fruit. The whole basket itself signifies the end of Israel. The Lord says, I will never again pass by them. I will never again pass over their sins like I did on that night of the 10th plague. When I visited Egypt, I visited the sins of the Egyptians because they didn't have the blood on their doors, but I passed over your houses because you had the blood smeared on the door, but by now there's no no blood on your doors. I will no longer be able to pass by your sin, but I will visit your sin like I did Egypt on that night. Israel has sang such raucous and empty songs to God. We heard that in chapter 5 and in chapter 6. They've been inventing music for themselves, inventing instruments for themselves in their idle time. But when their season comes to an end, their tune will change. Verse 3 says, What were once raucous songs or empty songs in the temple will become wailings and lamentations, howling lament. The irony, though, is that if Israel were to repent now, they would have joy on the day of the Lord. But because they're they're choosing their reward now, they're choosing to store up treasure now, the only song that will be for them that day is one of howling lament. The carnage and destruction will bring a stunned silence there in the end of verse 3. I think this is similar to chapter 6, verse 10, when the, Lord is, when the Lord finally appears in judgment to Israel on that day, there will be no mistaking that the Lord is finally known and seen, and, 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 and all will come upon the people, and their only response will be to shut their mouths in the face of this God whom they have so long rejected. That's what the fruit basket vision is putting before us, the end of of Israel. It's challenging, I think, for us to read this passage and have it to, to get beyond the theoretical, as if this is just, uh, you know, uh, yes, we know it's God, we know it's the Bible, we know it's God's Word, we know we're supposed to love it and read it, but it's, it's hard to get beyond the, this is an ancient people at an ancient time, it's, it's a theoretical thing that it's hard to understand 
But I think it helps for us to remember that while this passage is not about you and it's not about me, it's about Israel, that's true, that doesn't get us off the hook because the judgment we read here is typical. We talk about types a good bit as we're going through Exodus and in Amos. The judging work of God in Scripture, whether it was judgment at the flood, judgment on Sodom and Gomorrah, judgment on Egypt, judgment on the Canaanites, in Joshua, judgment in exile, whatever that judgment is, are manifestations of how God responds to sin. So yes, the the passage points to the the judging of unrepentant Israel, but it is typical of the, the way that God judges sin. So, So I want to encourage us to read this, not just theoretically, that God could theoretically visit people like this, and and maybe he did way back then, but this is how God responds to sin now. We might not see it this way, but this nature of God has not changed. We'll speak of this later, but in some ways, this passage, as strange as it may seem, is a breath of fresh air is a bucket of cold water on the stale heart to see God, see the reality of him. So if if you come this morning disoriented a bit in your relationship to God, let this reorient you to who he is. If you you deal with God primarily in the abstract, he's just kind of a, again, a theoretical idea, an abstract idea, Let this passage bring you back to earth. Uh, So many dead bodies thrown everywhere. That's not abstract. It's not theoretical. Certainly wasn't for Samaria and Bethel and Dan and Beersheba on the day of the Lord. If you have maybe uh, put God in your back pocket as your little assistant, bring him out every once in a while when you need some help. Let this passage uh, remind you of the grandeur of God who comes to judge nations and makes the kingdoms of the earth rise and fall. This is the God who reigns, not who is relegated to a small corner of life. So in some sense, this passage is, ironic as it may seem, a breath of fresh air to remind us of who this God is that we serve. He is holy and therefore he is terrifying to those who meet him outside of Christ. Even those who are gods are terrified when they meet this God in scripture. I think Josh referred to Isaiah 6 and in that throne room scene where Isaiah says, woe is me, I'm a man of unclean lips. And there's, there's John, when he's in the Revelation, in Revelation chapter 1, and he has the, the vision of the Son of Man revealed to him, and he says, I, I fell on my face as though dead in front of this God. Even in his own people, God provokes this reverence and this fear and this awe. So that's, if that's not what you think of when you think of God, or if that's just that's just not a part of your relationship with God, then I would would encourage you, number one, I bet part of that is because so much of your life is is diluted with a bunch of fluff that does nothing to remind you of, of the significance and the gravity of Yahweh. So number one, cut out the fluff. And then number two, get your Bible and get to know the anger of God as a reaction of his holiness. Get your Bible to see the unmatched power of God, his blazing holiness, his bright, uh, dazzling light. You meet him in his word. And I promise you, your Christian life will not seem stale for long. The end of Israel's existence is is coming because Israel is so crooked, as we saw in the third vision. And God is so holy. His his mercy and his patience have been on display for decades. We've talked at length that Amos is not a book of judgment. It's a book of God's mercy and his judgment held side by side, pointing to his holiness. That mercy has been on display for decades, and yet Israel continues and continues to reject the offer. 
Now, lest there be any accusation that God is unjust in his administration of judgment, through Amos, in verses 4 through 6, he presents evidence of Israel's crimes. So let's move on to the old evidence. Let's read verses 4 through 6. Hear this, you who trample on the needy and bring the poor of the land to an end, saying, when will the new moon be over that we may sell grain and and the Sabbath that we may offer wheat for sale, that we may make the ephah small and the shekel great and deal deceitfully with false balances, that we may buy the poor for silver and the needy for a pair of sandals and sell the chaff for wheat, describing the posture of of the sin of the people of Israel. The reason I call this the old evidence is because if if you're paying attention in Amos, this is not new language. This is the same kind of crimes that have come up before. There's lots of unfaithfulness mentioned in Amos. Uh, Their oppression of the poor, sexual immorality, uh, corrupt business practices, prideful arrogance in their military conquests, false worship, But this presentation of old evidence primarily is directed at Israel's oppression for the purpose of gain. That aspect of their covenant unfaithfulness is what is in view here. Of course, this is not their only sin, but it is the one that receives, I think, prominent attention in Amos. As the end of Israel comes, the last sin on God's lips towards Israel is their oppression for the purpose of gain. Profit, P-R-O-F-I-T, is the highest concern. Doesn't matter how you make that profit, doesn't matter who you step on, doesn't matter who, who you manipulate, doesn't matter who you annihilate, with well, the name of the game is making profit. The needy are the primary victims of this lust for profit that exists among the elite in Israel. They are, they are trampled on, they are annihilated, they are brought to an end, verse four says. And verses five and six give us three dynamics of this lust for profit, which results in the trampling or the oppression of the needy. Number one in verse five, first part of verse five, we see their contempt for worship. Regardless of what festival they're participating in, whether it's the new moon festival, which was commanded in Numbers 28, whether it's the weekly, pass, uh, weekly Sabbath gathering, their only thought is, okay, when will, this, when will this end so I can get back to selling my goods? Their only thought for us, their only thought on Sunday is, is coming to church and getting through it so I can get back to Monday morning to start making some more money. Number two, the second dynamic, not only are they, are they really, at least the ones directed to here, going through the motions, showing contempt for worship, just showing up to show up, but really with their minds set on the next day. In addition to that, they are, second half of verse five, cheating their customers using corrupt business practices. How, how thinking through ways that we can make the ephah small and the shekel great, essentially uh, trying to to sell less for more money. To sell less for more money. If I can make one ephah, which is a, a, a weight measurement, if I can call it one, but really just give them seven-eighths of an ephah, then after eight of them, I'll have a whole extra one to sell. That's 12.5% more profit at the end of the day. It might sound like a, a strangely specific sin, you know, dealing with weights and balances, but it's actually not. The, 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 the Mosaic Covenant gives attention to this. Leviticus 19, 35 and 36 says, you shall do no wrong in judgment in measures of length or weight or quantity. You shall have just balances, just weights, a just ephah and a just hen. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt. That last, that last phrase, you shall have just Balances, for I am the Lord your God. That brings some weight to how you fill out your timesheet, doesn't it? I am the Lord your God. You shall be just in your business dealings. Thirdly, the third dynamic of their lust for profit in verse six is that the, their, as we've seen in the rest of the book, their, their exorbitant interest in taxes, their unjust balances, their shrewd dealings have led to a situation of debt slavery. 
verse 6, uh, is not technically about man-stealing, that kind of slavery, but rather about functional slavery through debt. It's a similar language to what we heard at the very first charge against Israel in chapter 2, verse 6. Uh, they sell the righteous for silver and the needy for a pair of sandals, trample on the head of the poor, turn aside the way of the afflicted. I think it's notable that that in chapter 2 was the very first uh, mention of what Israel's crimes are. And now in chapter 8, these verses are the last specific mention of what Israel's sins are in the letter. So the very first mention of Israel's sin and the very last mention of Israel's sin mention this flavor of sin, oppression for the purpose of gain. This is what brackets Israel's sin in the whole book of Amos. It's not only Israel's sin. As we said before, Hosea is a contemporary of Amos, prophesying in the same time to the same people, and his focus is on their spiritual idolatry. So it's not that this is Israel's only sin, but this is what Amos has set in his sight. So what I want to do is set this within its larger covenant Context. This is the last opportunity we'll have in Amos to deal with this oppression for the purpose of gain flavor on their sins. So I want to I set that within its covenant to context. Ultimately, this sin is a failure to show concern for the needy. When I say needy, I don't just mean the poor, the materially or, or monetarily poor, but the, the covenant talks about the sojourner and the foreigner and the widow and the orphan, those who need who are in need. And God's concern for this group permeates the law, the prophets, and the writings, all three categories of the Old Testament. In the law, we read something like Deuteronomy 15, 7 to 8, which says, If among you one of your brothers should become poor, you shall not harden your heart or shut your hand against your poor brother, but you shall open your hand to him and lend to him sufficient for his need, whatever it may be. Of course, we see here in the prophets, this is a concern, and as well in the Psalms or the writings, we see Psalm 72, verse four, may he, speaking of the Lord, defend the cause of the poor of the people, give deliverance to the children of the needy, and crush the oppressor. This concern permeates the law, the prophets, and the writings, and of course, it spills over into the New Testament. Jesus, of course, Dozens of examples, uh, going to, ministering to the needy, the poor. In the epistles, James chapter 2, James says not to show partiality to the rich at the expense of the poor. In Galatians chapter 2, I think it's referring to the Jerusalem conference back from Acts 15, where Paul and Barnabas go down to Jerusalem. They eventually uh, uh, have fellowship with Peter, James, John. And in there, all the, those two parties, those going to the Jews and those going to the Gentiles, all confirm with one another that they are all eager to remember the poor as a part of their ministry. Galatians chapter 2, verse 10. So in every corner of Scripture, law, prophets, writings, New Testament, gospels, epistles, God's heart for the needy is present. What I want you to do, or what I want to show you, is to see the motivation for this concern. See, it's more than, okay, God cares about this, therefore his people should care about it. That, that's not the logic behind this. I want to read for you uh, a short passage in Deuteronomy chapter 24. You're welcome to turn there because we're also going to look at Deuteronomy 26 in a minute, which on my Bible is the same page, so I can kill two birds with one bookmark there. In Deuteronomy 24, I want to read verses 17 through 22. You shall not pervert the justice due to the sojourner or to the fatherless or take a widow's garment and pledge, but you shall remember that you were a slave in Egypt and the Lord your God redeemed you from there. Therefore, I command you to do this. When you reap your harvest in your field and forget a sheaf in the field, you shall not go back to get it. It shall be for the sojourner, the fatherless, and the widow that the Lord your God may bless you in all the work of your hands. When you beat your olive trees, you shall not go back over them again. It shall be for the sojourner, the fatherless, and the widow. When you gather the grapes of your vineyard, you shall not strip it afterwards. It shall be for the sojourner, the fatherless, and the widow. You shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt. 
Therefore, I command you to do this. What's the motivation for providing for the needy, for not, for not going back over your harvest a second time to make sure you get every grape, every sheave? What's the motivation for that? It's that you were once needy and the Lord also redeemed you. As long as the Lord saved you needy, you have no right to graduate beyond being concerned for the needy. That's the principle here. As long as the Lord saved you needy, you never graduate beyond being concerned for the needy because that's your story too. That's Israel's story too. We can never, for, excuse me, we can never get beyond having been in need of the Lord's mercy. We never stop having been in need and being in need of his mercy. We never outgrow the testimony of the Lord's kindness to us. And that's what's bracketing this section, Deuteronomy 24. You shall remember that you were a slave. That's why you should do this. You shall remember that you were a slave. Therefore, I command you to do this. That's what brackets this practice in Deuteronomy 24. We demonstrate humility before the Lord, knowing that we are in total reliance on his kindness, on his mercy. We demonstrate that humility when we extend mercy to others. That's what's happening there. It's, this is much, much more than just, oh, God cares about this, so we should care about it too. I've said this before on this series in Amos, that, that mercy received becomes mercy extended. Kindness received for the Christian becomes kindness extended. And if it doesn't, then one didn't receive kindness. One didn't receive mercy if there's a refusal to extend mercy. Our extension of concern is evidence that we know how we have been saved. Needy. That's how we were saved. And I want you to see how deep this runs. This is why I had Josh read all of Deuteronomy chapter 26 in the scripture reading. And what I want to focus on there is verses 12 and 13. You see, what it says in verses 12 and 13 is that as one is paying their, their, their tithe with their crops to the Levite, they are supporting the sojourner, the fatherless, and the widow so that they may eat within your towns and be filled. Verse 13, then you shall say before the Lord your God, I have removed the sacred portion out of my house, and moreover, I have given it to the Levite, the sojourner, the fatherless, and the widow, according to all your commandments that you have commanded me. I have not transgressed any of your commandments, nor have I forgotten them. So, how foundational is this concern for the needy in the Mosaic Covenant? This is how foundational it is. One cannot claim to have followed the commandment until they've done this. That's what verse 13 says. Then, after you've done that, after you've given your time, after you've supported in this way, then and only then can you say, I've done everything according to your commandment. I haven't, I haven't trespassed your law after the support in this way. So integral is the concern for the needy in the Mosaic Covenant that one cannot claim to have been blameless before the Lord no matter the exuberance, the frequency, or the volume of their worship. They cannot claim to have been faithful to the covenant until they have done this. No wonder. Israel's disregard for the needy, which goes beyond disregard, it's active oppression, but no wonder their disregard for the needy nullifies all of their other worship. Chapter 5, verses 18 through 20, uh, 21 to 24 here on the poster. No wonder their worship is nullified. External worship is not paired with a heart for the needy. This is a reality of what it means to worship the Lord our God. There, there, uh, indeed, I want to affirm here, there are some unique covenantal aspects of what's going on in Deuteronomy 24, Deuteronomy 26, that I'm not saying we apply in a one-to-one -one ratio. I'm not saying that you have, to, you have to have gone given money to the sojourner, the widow, and the orphan before you come to worship on Sunday or else it's valid, uh, invalid. 
It's not, it's not the case. There are some unique covenantal dynamics there between Israel and the Lord. But I, I think the principle remains valid. As long as you were saved needy, you never graduate beyond concern for the needy. Being saved out of spiritual need by the merciful God is the motivation behind kindness to the physically needy. This is not something that Christians can ignore. I'm not going to prescribe what that means for you as an individual. And we should also recognize that needy means way more than just the materially poor. I mean, as we've mentioned already, uh, the sojourner, the widow, the orphan, the fatherless. So needy means way more than just the materially poor. But I do think that Amos, not just this text, but the whole of the book, probes our hearts to see whether our worship of the Lord includes this concern motivated by the recognition that we were needy and we needed the strong arm of the Lord to redeem us. Therefore, the kindness shown to us when we were in need ought to extend to others in need. This old Evidence of Israel's crimes points to their failure to do such, their failure to show this concern, their failure to express justice and righteousness. Back to those foundational words from this book, their failure to do justice and righteousness in the face of the needy as shown in their old crimes. The rest of chapter 8, verses 7 through 14, details the calamitous judgment that will come as a result of Israel's crimes. So, what is the end of Israel going to look like? Well, if you double-click on the fruit basket to see what's inside, what you get is verses 7 to 14. That's what the end is going to look like for Israel. Verses 7 and 8 give us a summary judgment. The Lord has sworn by the pride of Jacob, surely I will never forget any of their deeds. Shall not the land tremble on this account and everyone mourn who dwells in it and all of it rise like the Nile and be tossed about and sink again like the Nile of Egypt? Once again, the Lord here swears by himself and and you might read pride of Jacob and remember that that's that, that same phrase came up in the last chapter, in chapter 6, verse 8. But there, the Lord said, I, I hate the pride of Jacob. And now he's, he's swearing by the pride of Jacob. So uh, which one is it? Does he hate it or is he swearing by it? Well, I think, I think what's going on is, yes, Israel's uh, false pride is condemned in chapter 6. But here, the Lord is, is calling upon what ought to be the pride of Jacob. Yahweh himself. So once again, the Lord is swearing by himself like he did in chapter four, verse two, guaranteeing the certainty of what Amos is about to say. I will not forget any of their deeds. Yeah, it's been 150 years or so since the inception of the northern kingdom and the Lord has tried to wake them up in various ways. We saw that in chapter four. But it seems that, you know, as far as they're concerned, consequences haven't come They seem to have enjoyed blessing. I mean, economic prosperity, uh, arrest from their enemies, military expansion. But the Lord does not forget any of Israel's deeds. They may have have moved on and begun to think, oh, I, I guess we got away with it. I guess this is okay. But the Lord's not forgetting is actually a cause to tremble. Israel has racked up a huge debt against the Lord and their sins are still on the balance sheet. Hey, just, just imagine, say, say your, uh, your credit card company forgot to send you an invoice for say six months in a row and you began to think, wow, I, I, guess, I guess they're good with this. Uh, I guess uh, they don't really need to be paid back. So, you know, six months turns into 12 months, turns into 18 months and, and after a while, 10 years go by and they haven't sent you a bill and you've just... I mean, racked it up. They're not, gonna, they're not gonna come calling for it, I guess. Until they do. And you get a letter in the mail and it says that you owe Visa $20 million by the end of the month. I mean, could you imagine? You would tremble, right? Your, your knees would shake and you would realize, oh shoot, they, they, they didn't forget. 
they did come calling for it. This is the case with sin. None of it escapes God's vision. I guarantee you, none of your charges escape Visa either. But more certain is that none of our sin escapes God's vision. Outside of Christ, friends, outside of Christ, God will not forget even a single sin. Doesn't matter how young, how old, how secret, how quiet, how public. God will not forget even a single sin for those outside of Christ. But in Christ, he will not remember even a single sin. In the new covenant, when the Lord is speaking of that, in Jeremiah 31, 34, he says, now this is after the the, the new hearts of flesh. I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. In Christ, he doesn't remember even a single sin. If you're an unbeliever here this morning, um, I want you to know that being right with God is possible, but only, only through Jesus Christ. It's the only way. It is very exclusive. It's not private. You don't have to pay to get in, but it's very exclusive. There's one way to be right with God, through the blood of Christ. To those who come to God outside of Christ, he will not forget your sin and the judgment we read this morning will be on you. But if you come to him in Christ, he will not remember even one sin because Christ already paid for them all. The Lord's remembrance makes the land tremble. They mourn at the thought of justice being done. And when the Lord visits, it will be like the annual flooding of the Nile, certain and inevitable. The next three pairs of verses reveal different aspects of that day of the Lord. Verses 9 through 10, when we read this, the sun going down, a feast turning into mourning, songs and a lamentation, sackcloth and ashes, baldness, mourning for an only son, a bitter day. We, we instinctively know, we might not get all the images, but we instinctively know this is not a good time. This is not a good day. The sun goes down. Another, another pointer back to the ninth plague, which we've seen before. Another pointer back to Israel is sliding into the place of Egypt. Israel is going to receive the judgment that Egypt received back in Exodus. Sackcloth showing that they're, they're, they're denying this, this scratchy potato sack kind of thing. They're denying their earthly pleasures because the only thing that matters is, being, is mourning over this evil. Israel's previously raucous songs turned into lamentation and the whole scene will be like the mourning for an only son, which would have been like extinction for a family. The only son's gone, the line is gone, the family's over. But I want you to see that the combination of this language in verses uh, nine through 10 anticipates that the judgment described here in verses nine through 10 will be revealed on the son. The judgment described here will be revealed onto Jesus Christ. On one level, we're reading uh, what boots on the ground will look like on that day. The news reporter will see the sun go down if there were such a thing there, reporting what's happening. But on another level, what we have here is anticipating the death of Christ when the sun goes down at noon. Matthew 27, 45, at the sixth hour, there was darkness all over the land. The sixth hour being 12 o'clock, noon. At that time, the the Passover feast of the previous night gives way to mourning as the disciples scatter and cower in fear as their Lord goes to the cross. Feasts turn to mourning. And it will be like the mourning for an only son because it will be God's only son. Exodus 4 God says to Moses to tell Pharaoh that Israel is my firstborn son, and if you don't let my son go, I'll take your son. Of course, that's what happens with the rest of that story. But God's judgment on Israel is a judgment on his son. So the judgment on Israel, God's son, points forward and anticipates the greater judgment on Jesus Christ, God's son. Son, as he submits to death as a substitute, Jesus will live the pattern of Israel. I don't know if you've ever noticed this before, particularly if you follow the events of the book of Matthew. 
Jesus comes out of Egypt, right, as a baby boy. He suffers in the desert with the enemy. He passes through the waters of the Jordan through baptism. And then he, as it were, fulfills the exile of Israel as he goes to the cross. Jesus walks the pattern of the nation of Israel. Israel is judged for their sin, which points to this greater judgment on Christ, which he, he repeats and he completes and fulfills. Christ's judgment is the one that paves the way to salvation. We've seen this many times. When we, when we observe God's judgment on his people, it's never an end in itself, but it anticipates a greater judgment by which salvation comes. Verses 11 and 12 speak of a unique kind of famine. Not the kind of famine we read about earlier with the locust plague or earlier in chapter 4. This kind of famine is far worse. Not a famine of bread, but a famine of hearing the word of the Lord. You know, a famine of the word is what Israel has been asking for. Right? Silencing the prophets and ignoring the prophets is asking for a famine. Israel wants a famine. Amaziah the priest wants a famine of God's word. But when it truly happens, they will stumble around like a drunk man looking for it and will be unable to find it. You know, the miracle of the Bible is that God speaks at all. The miracle of the Bible is that God has at all communicated, revealed himself to his people. And not only that, dwelt with his people. The word, his word is a lifeline to his people. It's the tree by which we are planted, in in which we grow. It is is the only living water that satisfies. But on this day, he will go silent. And with respect to the northern kingdom, it will be as if God is undoing his people. He is uncreating his people. The word creates and sustains. And when he goes silent, it will be as if he is uncreating them and leaving them to their own. The epitome of judgment is when the Lord removes himself from you. This is why exile is so horrendous. It wasn't just 70 years in a different country by the time it happens on Judah. God, the Lord, removes himself from his people. They will then realize how precious his words were. But they will not succeed in finding them. The time has run out. There had been ample opportunity. There is no injustice on God's part. There's no injustice on God's part. Time has run out. They have spurned a hundred times, a thousand times over their opportunity to hear from the Lord and repent. But on this day, the final word has been delivered. Israel's season is over. And then finally, briefly, verses 13 to 14, on that day, even the ablest young men and women will perish. They will fall like chapter 2 when it spoke of the the judgment in terms of military conquest, even he who is stout of heart among the mighty shall flee away naked in that day. None will be exempt from God's justice when he sends the nation of Assyria in judgment in just a couple of decades after Amos' words. They have looked to their own gods to save them. They have worshipped the Asherah in Samaria the fertility pole, literally a wooden stick. They've worshipped the golden calves, which Jeroboam I foolishly put in Bethel and Dan. And then every subsequent king of the north did not take away. They've been making pilgrimages to Beersheba. They've placed their hope in these things to help them, to support them. But on this day when the Lord visits, there will be no help. How many things do we place our hope in that have no ability, have no eternal value on the day of Christ? When on the day of Christ, what will fill our vision entirely, what what, what will be the entire windshield of what we can see will be Christ. And we will either rejoice at his return or you will weep at his appearing because you know for you it means what it meant for Israel, judgment. This is a difficult passage, but as I said earlier, I think this does reveal to us the character of our God, and it can function like a bucket of cold water on a stale 
Christian. If, if your faith is stale this morning, if your, your Bible reading has gotten predictable and your, your prayer life is, is stagnant and you're, you're occupied with so many other pressures, I think even a chapter like Amos 8 is a bucket of cold water to wake up Wake up to the, to the holiness of Yahweh that reacts in this way against sin. Maybe waking up to the holiness of Yahweh would, would condemn your sin, would expose your sin, and you would, you would once and for all fall at the feet of King Jesus and kill that sin. Maybe this wakes you up to the reality of God's wrath, which is real, Maybe it, it jumpstarts your evangelism. Maybe it, it makes you more bold because you know that, 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 that the thing you read on Sunday about Israel in Amos 8 might apply to this guy next to you. So maybe the waking up to this, this reality of God's wrath will be the spark to be bold with the gospel. Maybe this will wake you up to the undeserved, or remind you of the undeserved blessing of mercy that saved you. Maybe that's the thing that will motivate you to, to, to extend mercy and kindness to the needy. But most of all, I pray that this passage would point our eyes to Jesus Christ who delivers us from the wrath to come. Pray with me. God, we love you. We recognize the infinite ways that we fail. We don't even know how we sin. We're not even aware enough of our own hearts that are desperately wicked. Who can know it? Deceitful. God, we praise you for your mercy. We praise you for your grace. We thank you for the ways that Christ has paid for our Debt. We thank you for this chapter. We thank you for this book of Amos. We pray, God, that you would, you would use it to spur us on. You would use it to, to inject pressure into the corners of our hearts that, that reject, that still are trying to hold on. We all had those little corners in our flesh until we die, they'll be there. We pray, God, that one more corner might be swept out after this morning. We thank you for the supper we're about to take, God, and what, what a better thing to have before our eyes as we take the Lord's Supper than, 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 the, than the lengths to which your son went as he was spilling his blood and giving of his body to save us. We pray all these things in your name. Amen.